certainly one of the most uh, uh, famous experts in the topic is going to tell you that is uh, um, uh, uh, so the interactions in, uh, in biological systems and in what is called the soft matter is also well known for for being the author of a well-known book on uh, quantum many particle systems so thanks and as far as i heard that another book will soon come will yes. soon come yes, yes. So please, okay, so what do I do with this first? I okay, so hello, so as you, as Andrea said, uh, well, first of all, I want to thank uh, the organizers of the school for inviting me to give this uh, course. So uh, as you see, it's a course about uh, electrostatic interaction in biological systems. And uh, as we will see, it's the main interaction which uh, drive uh, the behavior of mostly all biological systems. And I will try to, to make it uh, understandable and sim simple to you. So actually, the outline of the, of the course will be the following, and I will do according to the time. Of course, you can uh, ask as many questions as you want. You can see me after if uh, there is things which are not clear, although I doubt it. But, uh, okay, so the course will be organized as follows. So today it will be the first part of the course will be very qualitative. I will just try to motivate and to explain to you where this, uh, uh, what is soft matter and uh, what is biological matter and uh, how this uh, interaction come into play. So I will give you a lot of examples and uh, to try to motivate uh, this study. Then today, or okay, so I don't know exactly how, uh, I don't know exactly how it will go, but I will talk about, I will make a review of electrostatics, what you learned in, uh, in school the previous years. But uh, it turns out when I started working in this field, I had completely forgotten my electrostatics. So I will assume that you also forgot a lot of it and that you forgot a lot also about thermodynamics and statistical physics. So I'll review the concepts and uh, all the things which are necessary to at least to understand the, the rest of the course. Then um, I will start uh, really in the heart of the matter, which is uh, starting with Poisson-Boltzmann theory, which is a simple mean field theory to describe ions in, uh, in electrolyte solutions, in uh, or in, in biological systems, and I will discuss so the Poisson-Boltzmann equation and its uh, linearized version, which is uh, so-called the Bayhuckel theory, and then I will discuss the problem in various geometries. So the planar geometry, which corresponds to the case of membranes in biology, so when you have a charged membrane in contact with uh, ions in a cell, so uh, you know that uh, as we'll see, uh, cellular membranes are charged kind of planar objects, and the cell is full of ions, so one can ask about that. Then the cylindrical case, the cylindrical case corresponds to uh, polyelectrolytes, so charged polymers in the cell, so charged polymers like DNA, RNA, proteins, so they are, because of the electrostatic repulsion, they are very cylindrical, they have a, a large so-called persistent length, and so this is studied in this context. And then the, the, the spherical geometry is the study, so it's in the case of indeed the spherical geometry, and then it's what's called colloids, so it's charged uh, spherical particles or non-spherical but essentially small molecules. Uh, then in the following I will go to a more advanced part which is the statistical field theory of charged systems. So if you want to go beyond the Boisson-Boltzmann theory, which is a mean field kind of approach, you need to include fluctuation effects, correlations, and for that matter, the natural framework is to write a field theory to express the, the statistical mechanics of this uh, Coulomb system as a field theory and do then what's called a loop expansion, and the loop expansion had zero order will be, as we shall see, the Poisson-Boltzmann theory, and then all the corrections are the effect of fluctuations and correlation on the system. 
and then I will show you some applications of this uh, loop expansion and places where these uh, fluctuation effects are important in these systems. And then uh, last uh, chapter will be further applications. So the first one is an uh, application. So as you will see in this case, uh, the only interaction which is present is a Coulomb interaction. But uh, there is one interaction which plays a particular role, which is the steric interaction. So the, the ions or the molecules have hard cores. So they, cannot come, they cannot penetrate each other. So there is uh, some steric repulsion. And we shall see how one can modify the Poisson-Boltzmann equation at mean field level to take into account the steric effect. Another uh, application is the case of dipolar fluids. So dipolar fluids the, are the most important because, of course, the most important fluid is water in biology and, and even in life. And water turns out to be a dipolar fluid, which means the, the water molecules are dipoles. And all many of the properties of water can be explained in terms of these dipoles. And then, if I have time, I will come to the subject which is quite uh, amazing, which is that uh, in a certain condition in salt solutions, identical charge can attract instead of, uh, of uh, having repulsive interaction. So you can have two positive charges which will attract because of the uh, surrounding background. Okay, so this is the outline of the course. I'm s okay. And uh, there are very, essentially no books on the, on the subject, but there are books which, so on the, actually on the last part, on uh, this part, there is essentially no, no book uh, that, but on all the rest, of course, on Poisson-Boltzmann, there are many references. A uh, famous one is Israel Ashvili, who, was, uh, who passed away recently, unfortunately. There is the book by Sam Safran. This is an old book by Verve Overbeck, which is very interesting. And this is uh, another book, which is one of the classic, uh, but uh, they're a bit old fashioned and uh, they use uh, older notation than I will. By the way, I will use a SI uh, system for electrostatics, whereas uh, most of these books are written in CGS. And, uh, but uh, I was raised with SI, so that's what we will do. Okay, so now I can start. So the first part will be this qualitative description of, uh, of uh, trying to motivate you. So as you know, in nature, you have four kinds of forces, strong, weak, gravity, and electromagnetism. So strong, weak are the ones which are relevant at uh, uh, subatomic scales in the nucleus uh, or below the nucleus inside particles in the structure of nuclei, neutrons, protons, etc. And this will be completely irrelevant in what we do because the, the, the scale is totally irrelevant. Then there is gravity, which is relevant at macroscopic and astronomical scales. It can be relevant in some cases in the soft matter physics, for instance, when you study sedimentation or things like that, where the gravity field plays a role. But in all the cases where we will be interested, we will see that this uh, gravity interaction is extremely small compared to the electromagnetic interaction. So the electromagnetic interaction is, of course, the interaction between charged particles. And it's the only relevant interaction between atomic and mesoscopic scales. So whenever you look, all the matter that surrounds us, at least the soft matter, uh, it's only dictated by the electrostatic and electromagnetic interaction, plus something which I will mention, which is the Pauli principle, which is the exclusion. But you could describe uh, most of the everyday physics of the materials that you see in terms of the electromagnetic interaction. Okay. And, of course, the form of the mag electromagnetic force is 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, Q1, Q2. So Q1, Q2 are the charges, and R is the distance. And these are the value. Uh, so I, in fact, 
this is not what you should remember, but the, the point is that 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 is 9, 10 to the 9 in SI units. Okay, and the charge of the electron is 1.6, 10 to the minus 9. So, as you can see, uh, if you compare gravity to uh, electromagnetic, you see that when you make the ratio, the distance disappears, and the ratio of the forces is always given in terms of the ratio of the constant, of the masses, and of the charges. And when you do the, the so as an exercise, you can compute the, the ratio of the two, and uh, if you look at two protons, if my memory is correct, the ratio for two protons, the ratio of electromagnetic uh, force to uh, gravity force is 10 to the minus 34. So you can happily forget about it. So as I said, the only relevant force is the electromagnetic one plus Pauli principle, which prevents the collapse. And all the other forces that we will see that are currently, that, that are used in uh, soft matter or in statistical physics are all uh, originating from electromagnetism and Pauli principle. And the unit of energy that we will use, so in physics it's electron volts, in chemistry people use kilojoules per mole or kilocalories per mole, and the correspondence is that one electron volt is about 100 kilojoules per mole. So one electron volt is 40 kT, and one kT is 0.025 electron volt. Okay, these are numbers you just to keep in mind to have a, an idea of the order of magnitudes of these uh, quantities. Okay, so I see that up to now, it's fine, okay. So what are the bonds? So in fact, all these, uh, all these uh, interactions which are present in, uh, in these systems can be described in chemistry in terms of several types of bonds. So there is the chemical bond, the, chemical bo the covalent bond, so the first one is the covalent bond, sorry, and the covalent bond is the, as you know, it's the, the bond which makes up molecules. It's essentially a binding of, uh, of uh, two uh, nuclei by exchange of electrons between the two. So this is described quantum mechanically. The interaction is really a Coulomb interaction mediated by electrons, and it's very strong. What's important to know is that the order of magnitude is very large, and so in most cases you can forget it's like an unbreakable bond. It's fixed and you don't worry about it at room temperature because because the energy of these covalent bonds is much larger than KBT, where T is uh, 300K, which is the ordinary temperature. Then you have uh, ionic bond. So ionic bond is really the pure Coulombic interaction between, uh, between the different atoms in the system. So the most famous structure is the crystal of NaCl, Na plus Cl minus. So it's a cubic structure like this where you have alternating Na plus, Cl minus, etc. And typically, the temperature or the energy of binding is typically one electron volt, about 100 kilojoule per, per mole. So it's also a very strong interaction, and as a result, the, the fusion temperature for this object is very high. And then you have, uh, then you have Another type of interaction, which is much weaker, which is the hydrogen bond, and which plays really a very important role in soft matter, biology, etc. And it's called the hydrogen bond. And the hydrogen bond is a bond which is particularly important in water. It's a, it's a bond which the value of which is 5 to 20 kilojoule per mole. So it's essentially of the order of 1 kT, or a little bit less. And it's a kind of directional dipole-dipole interaction between electronegative oxygens mediated by some H. Okay, I'm not going to discuss the exact nature of the hydrogen bond, but it's important in many cases, and it, particularly in, uh, in biological systems, in proteins, in all kinds of uh, things. Okay, and this, this is the 
energy scale of covalent, ionic, and hydrogen bonds in electron volts. So you see the strong, medium, and weak. In addition to that, there is a van der Waals interaction. So the van der Waals interaction is a long distance induced dipole-dipole interaction uh, uh, between, uh, between neutral objects. So if you have like uh, a neutral atom, when it's in presence of another atom, it gets polarized so the, because of the charges of the other atom. So they deform a little bit. By deforming, they get a dipolar moment. And this induced dipolar moment generates van der Waals interaction, which goes as 1 over R6 at large distances. And uh, it's of the order of 1 kBT. So it's responsible for the condensation of gas for adhesion when you, in the glues, for instance. It's van der Waals interaction, aggregation, uh, uh, flocculations in colloids, what else, and the many other effects in biology. And to balance this van der Waals interaction, it turns out that there is the so-called steric interaction, which is due to the Pauli principle, which prevents uh, the overlap of, uh, of uh, electron wave function, so which induces a very strong repulsion at short distance due to the Pauli principle. And very often, this is modeled as a hardcore interaction. So there is one interaction which captures both the van der Waals large distance interaction and the steric short distance interaction. It's the so-called Lennard-Jones potential, and the Lennard-Jones potential has this form. It goes at short distances, it's a repulsion, which goes like 1 over R12. And at large distance, it's an attraction, which goes like 1 over R6. And the shape of this uh, lennard jones potential goes like this. So it's extremely repulsive at short distance and weakly attractive at large distance. Uh, and uh, so the minimum is at a radius 2 to the 1, 6 sigma, which you obtain, I mean, you can study this, it's a very, and it's a very frequently used in models of, in simulations of atoms, uh, interaction of atoms in molecular dynamics of, uh, of uh, biopolymers or anything in, in chemistry. It's a very, very uh, present uh, interaction everywhere. Okay. Next comes the question, at what level do we describe uh, soft matter and, uh, and uh, biological matter? Is it quantum? Is it classical, etc.? So as you know, the crossover between quantum and classical is given in terms of the de Broglie length. So the de Broglie length so if you look at the, at the quantum particle, its kinetic energy is essentially h bar square k square over 2m, where k is the wave vector of the quantum particle. So this is the energy. Now the thermal energy of a particle is kBT. So when the quantum kinetic energy is smaller than the thermal energy, it means that thermal shocks will induce decoherence of the, part of the quantum particle, and the particle will behave classically. So you can define a length, which is called the de Broglie length, by equating the kinetic energy of the quantum particle with the thermal energy that gives this length. And so if you are looking at lengths which are smaller than this length, then the system will be quantum, will behave quantum mechanically. But if you are interested at distances or scales which are much larger than this, then the system will behave classically. So to give an example, so this is just what I said, if the distance between atom and molecule is much smaller than the de Broglie length, so the thermal fluctuations are not strong enough to induce decoherence in the wave function of the atoms and molecules, and therefore you need a, quad, a quantum description of the system. So if you look at room temperature, 300 K, for hydrogen atoms you can calculate, and you find that the, the Broglie length is one angstrom. Uh, as you, uh, you see that the, the Broglie length 
is, uh, goes like 1 over square root of m. So the larger the mass, the larger the mass, the smaller the de Broglie length. So heavy particles are less quantum than light particles. And of course, uh, so for hydrogen atom, it's one angstrom. For oxygen at molecules, it's 0 0.16, 0 0.18 atoms, uh, angstrom, sorry. And so since we are looking always at scales which are typically larger than these, we can use classical mechanics to describe the system. The only exception usually is when you look at electrons. So electrons are 2,000 times lighter than protons. So the length is 1 over square root of 2,000. And the length is 45 angstroms. And therefore, if you look at an electron gas in a metal, even at, th at room temperature, it is quantum. And there is no way you can describe an electron gas as a classical particles at room, even at room temperature. OK. So what are the scales involved in soft condensed matter? So I will go in review of the various materials that, uh, that are relevant to this uh, study. So I, I guess up to now, there is no question. Right? OK. So th these are uh, examples of uh, materials, uh, which I will detail a little bit <laughs> later. But as you can see, so there are polymers, liquid crystals, colloids, amplifiers, biomolecules. And typically, the scale goes from nanometers to micrometers everywhere. So of course, polymers can be quite long, up to micrometers. Liquid crystals, typically, uh, what defines liquid crystals, if you have layers of liquid crystals, it's the inter, inter layer distance, which, are, which is typically of, of the order of a few tens of nanometers. Colloids, the colloidal particles themselves can be from tens of nanometers to micrometers. Amphiphiles uh, make uh, membranes. They make also uh, micelles, and micelles have the time kind of scale. And the only ones which are a little bit smaller are biomolecules like DNA, RNA, or proteins, uh, which are really more microscopic, but still uh, in the range of the nanometer, let's say. OK, so now, what is characteristic of soft condensed matter? and biological system is that it's matter that can easily deform by either applying a small or man, man mechanical force or even simply by thermal fluctuation itself. And the hallmark of this uh, system is that uh, in this system, the internal energy or the internal enthalpy of the system is essentially of the same order of magnitude as the entropy. As a result, the system is very flexible and very soft. Uh, hence the name of soft matter. So soft matter, you have it everywhere, food products, rubber, plastics, gels, paste, emulsions, creams, detergents, paints, you name it. Everything you see essentially, except metals and, uh, and maybe glass, everything is soft matter. And uh, in biological systems, you have tissues, all the tissues, skin, muscles, blood, DNA, all the biopolymers, etc. OK. So OK. Oh. OK, so polymers, uh, I remind you what's a polymer. A polymer is a macromolecule consisting of the repeat of a certain uh, unit. So for instance, here, it's polyethylene. So polyethylene is the chain C2H4. C2H4, and when you polymerize it, you get something like this, and you get you can make a very long molecule where you repeat a single unit by polymerization, and you get a chain which is very long. And there are several types of polymers. So this is a linear polymer. So it's a single chains which are like this. They can be branched if you have some branching around, or cross-linked if you make a gel or something like that. Then you have phases also of liquid crystals. So liquid crystals are liquids which are made of molecules which are not spherical. So if your molecule has a certain shape, it can have some ordering 
between liquid and crystal, and these orderings are called liquid crystals. So this type of ordering is called nematic. That's when the axis of the liquid crystal are oriented, but still the molecules can move around, but there is a preferential direction of all the, of all the axis of the molecules. If you compress further, you can have a lamellar kind of phase where the, because of the steric repulsion still, not only you have this, uh, this directional orientation, but also you will have a layering of the, of the molecules, and these layers are called smectic phase. And then there is a smectic A, smectic C, which I will not discuss. Yes? Sorry, I, I'm sorry, I don't. How would one calculate the entropy for a polymer? Is it like a Boltzmann entropy? Yes, but uh, uh, the entropy of a polymer, you, you have a, a chain and you calculate how many configurations the chain can do. So this is a statistics, it's a statistical mechanics. It's like a random walk. But it can take continuous. So it can be either continuous or it can be, if it's continuous, it's called a Brownian, a continuous Brownian motion. If it's on a, you can also imagine model polymers as, a, as a models on a lattice, in which case it's a discrete uh, Brownian motion. So in all cases, if there is no interaction, you can calculate exactly the entropy of the polymers. Now, if there are interaction like uh, excluded volume or self-avoidance, then it's more complicated, but still there are ways to calculate uh, approximately this entropy. Okay, so polymers, liquid crystals, and then amphiphiles. So amphiphiles are interesting molecules which are extremely present in biology. Amphiphiles, so amphi means uh, in Greek both or all, and philes is to like. So it's molecules which have a head which likes water and a tail which doesn't like water. So the head is hydrophilic and the tail is hydrophobic. So as a result, if you take these amphiphile molecules and put them in water, they will form certain structures to avoid that the hydrophobic tail will be in contact with water and so that the heads, which are hydrophilic, will be in contact with water. So by doing that, for instance, if you have oil, if you have a mixture of oil and water, then the amphiphile molecule will <coughs> coat the oil droplets so that uh, the tail with the hydrophobic tail will be in contact with the oil and the hydrophilic head here will be in contact with the water. And this is the, the principle of uh, soaps or detergents, right? That's how soaps walk, work and uh, clean up things. So uh, you can have, this is called a micelle. This uh, self-organization of these uh, amphiphile molecule, so there are several geometries of amphiphiles, but the basic principle is that the head is hydrophilic and the tail is hydrophobic. So you have all kinds of phases when you take these amphiphiles and uh, mix them and put them in a mixture of water and oil, you have all kinds of uh, very interesting uh, phase diagram with uh, lamellar phases, with hexagonal phases, cubic phases, and uh, these are more exotic phases, and there is uh, even these uh, bicontinuous phases called uh, Plummer's Nightmare, which are zero curvature. Okay, anyways, complicated phases. In addition, uh, in there is uh, something which are called uh, colloids. So colloids are essentially uh, small uh, spherical particles which can aggregate or crystallize and make these kind of structures. So this is a colloid made of polystyrene, poly PS, polystyrene uh, spheres. And you can see all kinds of phases, ordered phases of these colloids. And uh, also you have biological membranes. So biological membranes are the membranes which surround the, which surround the cells and they are made of uh, phospholipids, which are these amphiphilic molecules, 
which self-assemble to, to form some kind of micelle, and inside this membrane there is uh, all the apparatus of the cell. Okay, so now let's come, so I gave you a simple description of uh, ions, of, uh, sorry, of soft matter in general. So now let's come more generally to uh, the Coulombic part, to the ions and things like that. So ions uh, in liquids, soft matter and biology. So the most important, of course, the most important part in biology is water because everything in biology takes place in water. So water, as we know, is a molecule which has this shape, this V shape with a given angle. So the oxygen is slightly, is highly electronegative and the hydrogen is electropositive. And it has a large dipolar moment. I will we'll come back to this question later. The dipolar moment is 1.85 Debye. And one of the characteristics of the water is that it has a very high dielectric constant, which is typically of the order of 80. The relative, so the relative uh, dielectric constant of water is 80. The vacuum or air, the dielectric constant is 1, which means that, as we'll see, the Coulomb interaction in water is 80 times weaker than in the vacuum or in the air. So, for instance, if you take an ionic crystal, so ionic crystals or ionic liquids, so which means liquids made purely of, of ions with no solvent, just pure plus and minus ions. So, they, as I said before, as we saw, they can make cubic lattices with a high melting temperature because, the, because, of, the, because of the high energy the high binding energy of the, of the bonds, of the ionic bonds. But it turns out that uh, in some cases, these ionic liquids can be liquid at room temperature. And that's used in uh, fuel cells, in batteries and fuel cells. So it's uh, purely a fluid made of plus and minus, plus and minus ions, and it can be liquid. Now, this ion, so this, these are very important. It's, it's gaining more and more important because uh, technologically, uh, these uh, fuel cells are very inter interesting to develop. And there is many work on trying to find very highly charged uh, fluids to use in, in fuel cells. OK, another kind of thing is ionic solution. So ionic solution, this will be one of the subjects we will study. You have uh, ions which are dissolved in water, in a liquid, in a dipolar liquid solution, polar liquid solution like water. So this is a salt. Of course, all the biology takes place in the cell in physiological condition. Physiological condition is essentially salt water. So now, as you know, when you put salt in water, the crystal salt will dissolve. The reason is dissolved is due to the large dielectric constant of water. The dielectric constant of water is 80, so which means that the attraction between Na and Cl in water is 80 times weaker than in the air. So if you put your salt in water, the interaction is decreased 80 times, and therefore the salt will dissolve. Of course, until if you put more and more salt, there is saturation at some point because there is also a balance with entropy. But that's uh, something like that. So there are uh, several electrostatic length scale, which we will uh, see all over. So one is the so-called Bjerum length. So the Bjerum length, if you take the interaction between two charges, two electronic charge. So the elementary charge that we will deal with, with all the time is the electron charge. So if you take the interaction of two electronic charges, the interaction is E squared over 4 pi epsilon 0. Epsilon r is the relative dielectric constant, time r. And if you multiply by beta, so beta v is, a, is dimensionless, right? 
because V is an energy, so beta V is dimensionless, and, uh, and therefore if it's dimensionless, you see that since this goes like one over R, you can write it as LB over R, where LB, this LB is called the Bierum length, so it's beta, so you just can read it off here, it's beta E square over four pi epsilon zero epsilon R. And it's essentially the distance at which Coulomb energy is equal to the thermal energy. So if you have two charges at temperature, bet so beta is one over KBT, by the way, I must have said it before. So if you look, the distance at which the electrostatic energy is equal to KBT, this distance is called the Bierum length. And it's given like this, okay? And if you look uh, at the bare room length, so this is the number which, which will be very present all the time. You have to keep, keep it in mind. The bare room length in water is seven angstroms. And in the air, it's 80 times more. So in the air, it's 560 angstroms. Okay. A few more slides on this uh, qualitative uh, description. Another length, <coughs> which will be very important, is the Debye length. So if you have a solution with a salt with mobile ions, so the ions are dissolved. So of course, the, what we will study in the following is mobile ions. So because if the ions are not mobile, it's electrostatics. And this you have studied, I will review that later. But the point is that when you, have, you, when you have mobile ions which can move in a solution, then they have a certain entropy and there is a balance between the electrostatic energy and the entropy which makes the system behave and have a very interesting behavior. So what you can show that if you have in a solution, if you have positive and negative ions which are mobile, then if you look at the effective interaction between two charges, so if you have, uh, so if you have a, a charge, uh, let's say plus, minus, and you have uh, salt all around, the interaction, the Coulomb interaction is no more, uh, I forgot a one over R by the way. The interaction is no more Q1, Q2 over four pi, epsilon zero, epsilon R, one over R. That would be the standard Coulomb interaction. There is a misprint here, there is a one over R here. But this interaction is screened. There is an effect which is called screening, which we'll study in detail in the coming lectures. And the screening makes, the, due to the, to the cloud of positive and negative ions in the solution, this will decrease enormously the interaction and make it as e to the minus r over l to the d, l index d. And this length is called the Debye length and its expression is given here. So it depends on the dielectric constant. It depends on the density, on the concentration of the salt. N is the concentration of the salt of the positive or negative ions. And Q is the valence of the ions in the solution. And if you want to have a evaluation, a simple formula, it's 0.3 nanometer by square root of N, where N is the concentration of the salt expressed in molar. A mole is a number of Avogadro molecules per liter. So in physiological conditions in the cell, the concentration of salt is typically 0.1 molar and the Debye length is one nanometer. So, which means that beyond this distance, there is no more Coulomb interaction. The Coulomb interaction beyond that distance is completely suppressed. So the Coulomb interaction exists only within a radius of the order of the Debye length. Okay, there is another distance which uh, I will discuss uh, when it comes. Okay, so to be complete, there is another thing, 
uh, which is uh, very important in all these uh, systems, which are acids and bases. So acids are donor, are proton donors. Yes. Yes. No, no, so there is two effects. One comes from here, from this one over epsilon r. This, the, the, when epsilon r increases, so this increases. And of course, when epsilon r increases, it increases the, the range of the Coulomb interaction by, uh, by increasing the Debye the length, but it, de it decreases the strength. Right, the strength of the debye huckel interaction is, goes like one over epsilon r. So if epsilon r is large, the strength is very small. On the other hand, the range is slightly increased by uh, by this L, by this square root of epsilon d. The square root. No, I will will see that it's uh, okay. Not really, no. No. Okay, so uh, this is the old standard definition of acids and bases. So an acid is something which uh, dissociates uh, into H plus A minus. So it's a donor of protons. And the base is a donor of a hydroxyl, hydroxyl group OH minus. So BOH gives this. And of course, the, the uh, in terms of water, what happens is that when you put water, when, when you put uh, acid in water, the uh, H plus, which, is, uh, which comes out of this uh, dissociation, it binds to H2O to make this uh, hydronium uh, complex plus A minus, because uh, H2O is uh, very eager to bind to H plus, and that's and you have all this dissociation that you learned in high school, probably, and which I will not discuss. So everything is uh, defined in terms of uh, dissociation constant. And uh, you have strong acids if they are completely dissociated, weak if they are partially dissociated, etc. OK. Uh, so what are some examples of charged soft and biological matter? So in biological systems, you have, of course, in all cells, in all biological fluids, you have Na plus Cl minus, which are floating around. You have it in seawater. All the organisms which live in seawater are uh, plunged, are, are swimming in NaCl. Uh, you have also a lot of uh, potassium ions. And the balance between Na plus and K plus, between the sodium and potassium ion, maintain osmotic balance between the fluids inside and outside the cell. There is magnesium ions. So the magnesium ions are very important to regulate the behavior of DNA and of chromatin. Uh, they are divalent, divalent uh, ions, very important. So you have also all kind of other compounds, ions, which are present in, in biology, in biological systems. The examples of polyelectrolytes. Uh, so polyelectrolytes, as I said, it's polymers which have charged groups. So the, well, the most well-known example is DNA and also RNA proteins. So the, what is uh, important to know is that because you have all these charges along the chain, the chain is very rigid. It has what's called a large persistence length. So locally, it is like a tube. And therefore, we will study uh, what happens, how the ions around a cylinder uh, behave in a system like this. Uh, you have other polyelectrolytes, actin, tubulin, which, uh, which are uh, making up the skeleton of uh, cells and which are microtubules, for instance, is important in the cell division 
and it's a polyelectrolyte. And you have also synthetic uh, polyelectronite like PSS, polystyrene sulfonate. Charged colloids. <coughs> uh, so colloids are small objects, as I said, spheres, ellipsoids, etc. The size ranges from nanometers to micrometers because of uh, Van der Waals interaction. So there is a Van der Waals attraction between them. They tend to aggregate. And when they aggregate, there is, it's a phenomenon called flocculation, which is a phase transition. So the colloids can be either dispersed or they condense and form uh, aggregates, which are fractal aggregates. And this phenomenon is called flocculation. And to prevent this flocculation, there are two options. One is to code the colloids with polymers. So if you have polymers, then the polymer will prevent the aggregation of the, of the colloids. And otherwise, you charge them. You put some charge on the colloids, positive or negative, and then they cannot collapse and they cannot. Uh, and colloids are very important, in, for instance, uh, in cosmetics or in paints or things like that. So you don't want them to flocculate because if they, because what's, or milk also, milk is a colloid. But, uh, so you don't want to, to have flocculation because flocculation is just a separation and then you lose all the properties, all the nice properties of this, uh, of this solution. Okay. Yes, so these are examples uh, of uh, colloids, water-based paints, particles, paint, pigment particles in ink, milk, etc. And finally, charge membranes. So charge membranes, so the membranes in the cell is made of two layers of phospholipids. So phospholipids means it's a kind of amphiphile molecule with a charged, with a hydrophilic head and hydrophobic tail. So you have the hydrophobic tails which isolate uh, which, which bind together on both sides. So that makes a membrane which isolates the outside of the cell from the inside of the cell. Okay, and uh, in these uh, biological membranes, they are charged. So 10 to 15% of the lipids, which are the constituents of the membranes, are charged. And this uh, leading to a charge density of 0.3 electron per nanometer square which means if you take 0.3, if you take one nanometer square, you have 0.3 electron typically in this. Okay, so these are the use of, uh, of uh, charged lipid. They, they assist the binding uh, of uh, charged molecules and charged, charged atoms inside the cell. They, they do exocytosis, endocytosis by absorbing Okay, it doesn't matter. And there are also, uh, by these electron, by these uh, Coulombic interactions, you can have ion channels which are fixed on the membranes and which allow the traffic of small ions from the inside to the outside of the, of the molecule. This is very important in, in the function of the, of the cell. These ion channels are responsible for the communication uh, between the inside and the outside of the cell. Okay, a last thing that I want to mention is a concept that we will use, which is the concept of uh, osmotic pressure. So what is osmotic pressure? Uh, so the osmotic pressure is the following. Uh, when you have, so you can have a solvent like water and assume that you put some particles inside, like colloids, small spheres, or whatever solute, so it can be whatever you want. So then you put a membrane here, which is a semi-permeable membrane. So the membrane is semi-permeable, which means that it lets the solvent molecule, so it lets the water circulate perfectly easily with no problem, but the solute molecules are bigger and they cannot go through the membrane. So you see that the situation is exactly the same as that of a gas of particle with a piston. 
the solvent would play the, it's like uh, if you take air, so the solvent, since it, it's equilibrated on both sides, it doesn't play any role. So you see that the solute molecules which are here, since they cannot go out, they exert a pressure on the cylinder, on the piston here, and this pressure of the solvent on the external cylinder is called the osmotic pressure. And of course, for a perfect, if you neglect interactions uh, between these, uh, between these uh, solute molecules, the pressure is given by the ideal gas law, pi equals mkvt. And what I want to emphasize is that this law, in an ionic solution, this law is also true. So this law is a, is a law in principle for perfect ideal gases, so gases of particles without interaction. Of course, if you have an ionic solution, you have strong interactions because you have a Coulomb interaction between the particles. However, if you are at thermal equilibrium, there is no flow. So locally, the electric field is essentially zero, and therefore the ions don't see any interaction because the local field seen by each ion is essentially zero at equilibrium. And therefore, the ions in a solution, in a neutral solution, the ions are essentially free, and therefore this formula applies quite well to ionic solutions. So we will see uh, how one can obtain this in the case of uh, charged solutions and what are the corrections to this uh, equation. Okay, and this is uh, the end for this uh, short uh, presentation of the qualitative part of this. So now I go to the overview. So is there any question about this? No? Okay, it's just a presentation. You don't have to... <laughs> you can just check that, uh, that the ratio of uh, gravity to electrostatic is very, very small. Okay, so now I go... Uh, I will try to, to go to... Uh, uh, overview of electrostatics. Okay. Okay. Okay, so if you have two particles, Q1, with charge Q1, Q2, vector R12, then the force between the two is 1, as we saw, 4 pi epsilon 0, Q1, Q2 over R12, times R12, so R12 square, R12, so R12, this is the unit vector along R12. Okay. So I give you the, the values uh, to know. So this constant, as I said, in SI unit is 9, 10 to the 9. And the electron charge, which we will use, uh, is 1.6, 10 to the 19, minus 19 Coulomb. Okay. So if we look, uh, so the force, as we know, the force can be written as Q times E. So, uh, for instance, if I look at the force acting on, point, on any point, so since the, see, if I have a charge, sorry, if I have a charge Q1 here, and I want to see what is the force created here on that point, so Q1, the force is 
f equals qe with e equals 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 q1 divided by r minus r1 to the square times r minus r1 vector uh, unit vector along this okay now if i have many charges if i have charges q1 q2 qi etc if i look at the electric field created at a certain point r it's given by 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 sum over i equals 1 to n if i have n charges times qi over so a way to write it is to write as r minus ri to the q times r minus ri or uh, or you can write it also as 1 over r minus ri to the square and the unit vector r minus ri but like this but this is a bit uh, easier to write okay so now if we look at the force and we look at the work of the force we see that the work of the force that the force can be written as minus gradient a certain potential energy and the potential energy is u equals 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 so this is for f12 between 1 and 2 and this is just q1 q2 over r12 so that's the potential energy of two charges at distance r12 in this configuration now if you remember that the force is qe then you see that e is minus gradient phi where phi is the electrostatic potential and phi in that case uh, will be equal to 1 over 4 pi sorry i forgot no that's okay 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 uh, and if i look at phi at point r created by a particle at point r1 it will be 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 q1 over r minus r1 that's if i have a particle at r1 particle q1 at r1 if i look at the electrostatic field at point r and e is given by this and if i have many particles many charged particles then phi of r like in the case of coulomb is 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 sum over i of qi by r minus ri Okay. What else did I want to say? Yes. So if I define the, and this is uh, something quite important, if I define Vc of R minus R prime equals 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 1 over r minus r prime you see that the this formula which is here tells you that q of r phi of r is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 uh, is equal sorry to sum over i of uh, uh, qi Vc of r minus ri, right? Because this term, one over four pi epsilon zero r minus ri, is just this. So, 
phi of r is just sum over i of qi vc of r minus ri. And if you see, if you have particles qi at point ri, you can define a charge density rho of r equals sum over i of qi delta of r minus ri, where delta is the Dirac distribution function. Everybody is uh, familiar with the Dirac. So this is the charge density created by particles of charge qi at point ri. Okay? So if you use this notation, then you see that phi of r is the integral d 3 r prime of vc of r prime of r minus r prime rho of r prime. So this can be an exercise if you want. So you just have to replace, do the integral and check. It's completely simple. And as a result, from this identity, which, which is obtained for a set of discrete charge, this identity is also valid for any distribution of charges. So if you have any distribution of charge rho r, so it can be smooth charge distribution, it can be whatever you want, then the electrostatic potential is given by this expression, where rho of r is the charge distribution of the particles. Now, if you look, uh, how is the electrostatic field, the electric field, so the electric field is minus E at point R is minus gradient phi of R. And what is gradient VC? So if I look, what is gradient with respect to R of VC of R minus R prime? Well, essentially, it's going to be uh, the elect it's going to be related to the, to the electrostatic field. So either you calculate the gradient directly or you, you go to the, I mean, it's directly related to the electric field. So it is minus 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 sum over i of r minus r i. Uh, actually, no, sorry, it's only one. So it's minus r uh, minus r prime divided by r minus r prime cube. And therefore, this is, since it's minus, you just, so it's minus integral d3 r prime gradient r vc of r minus r prime a rho of r prime and uh, therefore e of r you replace the gradient by this expression is 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 integral d 3r prime of r minus r prime divided by r minus r prime q rho of r prime. <coughs> so this is expression, the equivalent expression of this. Okay. Any question to this point? So there are three types of geometry that will be 
uh, that we will study and which I put here. So the point geometry, so rho of r is q delta of r. For instance, this is if you have a particle at point r, at point zero, the phi, phi of r is 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 q over r, and the electric field is minus 1 so it's plus 1 over 5 pi epsilon 0 q over r square r unit vector. That's for the point. Okay, that's trivial. Then if you have a line, so the point is uh, like this, right? You have q here, and uh, you look uh, at a certain distance r. You have now, you can have a charge line. So a charge line is defined by a density, by a linear density, rho of r equals lambda delta of x delta of y. So if the line is along the z-axis, here you have x, here you have y. Okay? So the density is given by this. Lambda is the so-called linear charge density, then the potential, I will write it after, and the electrostatic field, so the electrostatic field is uh, perpendicular to, to the, I mean, uh, perpendicular to the z-axis, it's in the parallel to the, to the plane here, phi is lambda over two pi, not phi, E is lambda over 2 pi epsilon 0 r vector r. So if you are distance r from the, from the line. And the corresponding electrostatic potential is logarithmic. It's minus lambda over 2 pi epsilon 0 log r over r0. So you have to introduce, in that case, you have to introduce, um, you see, the, it's an infinite object. The line is an infinite object, so it's extended, so you have to, defini to define a reference of potential because all, all these expressions make sense uh, when the when the charges are confined in a finite volume. If the charges are not confined to a finite volume, like the case of an infinite line, you have to define an origin of potentials, and therefore it's this quantity R0, which is arbitrary. You see that phi is not an observable. The observable is really the electrostatic field. What counts physically is the difference of potentials. It's never the potential value itself. So you can fix its zero value at any scale you want. So R0 is an arbitrary scale that you choose to, to fix uh, the potential, the zero of potential. The important thing to think about is that the, the potential is logarithmic. It goes like log R. And uh, as we will see, this is uh, responsible for a famous phase transition in uh, in ionic liquids when you have a line in presence of counter ions, so of ions, a charged line with ions which are in opposite, uh, oppositely charged, what happens is that the interaction energy of the ions with the line is logarithmic, but the entropy of the ions is also logarithmic. So you can have a balance and you have a transition between bound ions and unbound ions and I will come back to this uh, later. This is called the Manning condensation, which is uh, something we will study. The last uh, geometry is a plane. So if you have a charged plane with a sigma density, charge density sigma, so the charged plane is something like this. 
So how did I? Yes. So if this is the z axis here, are the x and the y. So rho of r is sig is a sigma delta of z. Delta of z is this uh, plane. Then uh, the e, the electrostatic potential is sigma over two epsilon zero z. So where z is the unit vector in the z direction. So you know that when you have a charged plane, the electric field is independent of your distance with respect to the plane, which of course makes sense because there is no, no scale in the problem because this is infinite. And the corresponding phi is sigma over two epsilon zero with a minus presumably and modulus of z. So the potential is linear in, as a function of the distance to the plane. So these are tr three geometries that we will study in detail uh, in the coming lectures. But it's good to remember this. Another uh, case which is very important is the case of dipole. So I, I guess all this is familiar, right? You have all studied this in uh, elementary school. Okay. So no question? Okay, so the dipole. Uh, okay, so let's say, so a dipole is, uh, so if this is the z-axis, uh, I put a plus q charge here, minus q charge here, at minus d over 2. So the charge density is uh, rho of r. How can I? Okay, so it's Q times delta of uh, Z minus D over 2 minus delta of Z plus D over 2. In fact, the potential phi of R is 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 Q times 1 over R. So if I have if this is point R, so R is the coordinates x, y, z. So this point has coordinates 0, 0, d over 2. This one has coordinates 0, 0, minus d over 2. So it's R minus this, so it's 1 over square root of x squared plus y squared plus z minus d over 2 square minus 1 over square root of x square plus y square plus z plus d over 2 square. Now, if you look at distances such that r is much larger than d, you can expand this to first order in powers of d over r. And of course, I leave you to do that as an exercise. It's a classic exercise. And what you find is that phi of r is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 times p r over r cube. No, either r over r squared, if I write it like this. Where p, the vector p which enters here, is q times d. 
or QD, let me write it as a Z. So it's essentially the vector, this is the vector which connects the negative charge to the positive one, going from the negative to the positive, the unit vector times D. So this is the moment, the, the so-called dipolar moment. Okay. And of course there is a correction the correction will be of order 1 over r cube. Okay. From this you can get the electrostatic field the electrostatic field created by a dipole, so at point R, so E of R equals one over four pi epsilon zero. So three P scalar R R minus R <coughs> which you obtain by taking the, the minus uh, gradient of this phi of R. Okay. Any question? So please try to derive these uh, by doing the expansion. And, uh, I'm sure you have seen that already. You probably forgot, but... Uh, I don't know if I could do it again, but okay. Um, now, if instead of uh, one dipole we have many dipoles, of course it's additive, so the the total uh, the total um, dipolar moment. If you have uh, small dipoles like this everywhere, so p is going to be sum over i. Okay, the density, so one can define what's called the dipolar density. And the dipolar density, or the total dipole, is given by integral d3r of r, rho of r, where rho of r is the density of charges. So actually, you can do also an expansion of this to first order in, in D, and that's easy. You see that if you, if you assume that D is small, then you expand to first order. So if you expand to first order, then Q is delta of Z minus D over two D, uh, okay, delta prime Z of Z. So this is the expansion to order one of the delta function. And the other one is minus delta of Z minus D over two delta prime of Z. And therefore it's equal, so the delta disappear, which, which is a sign that the system is neutral, and you get minus Q D delta prime of Z, which in some sense is just minus Q D. So you can write it if, if this is the dipolar moment and this, so you can write it as follows, as minus P gradient delta of R. I don't know if it is uh, clear, but you can see that as an exercise also. Right, because P is along the Z axis, so the 
this gives you only a d by dz. It's, it's essentially pz, which is qd, times d by dz of this. Okay. Okay. Okay, then Gauss theorem. That's an important, important thing. So what does Gauss law tell you? Gauss law tells you that if you have a certain volume V surrounded by a certain surface S, and uh, this is the normal to the surface, so Gauss law is that the integral over the surface S of n ds e, or let me write it, e n ds. So you assume that you have some charges inside, and that the normal, so it's a closed surface, and the normal is oriented towards the exterior, exterior of the surface. So n is a unit vector normal to the, yes? Uh, did you explain delta function? Here? Yes? Delta function, you can expand distributions. It's perfectly legal. It's, uh, you do a Taylor expansion of distributions like this, like normal functions. It's itself a distribution, so it's mathematically it's defined by, by its action on uh, functions. But uh, it's perfectly legal. Okay, we'll come back to that. You will see uh, when we'll study dipolar fluids, uh, we'll come back to that. So the Gauss theorem, the Gauss law, sorry, states that this integral of the, f so this is called the flux of E through the surface E. Uh, uh, through the surface S, the flux is equal to the total charge enclosed by S. So the total charge divided by epsilon zero. So it's one over epsilon zero integral in the volume V D3R of rho of R, where rho of R is the charge density inside the, the volume V. So this, this is a very useful uh, theorem because it allows you, for instance, uh, to derive the electric field near a plane or the electric field created by a cylinder, by a line. Uh, you use symmetries and things like that. Maybe, um, okay, as an exercise, use Gauss law. to get uh, Coulomb potential for point line plane. That's a standard exercise. Okay, and from this, uh, from this uh, Gauss law, you can deduce uh, the fact that divergence of E of the electric field, which is, is equal to rho of R divided by epsilon zero. So these two are strictly equivalent. This is the integral formulation of Gauss law, and this is the differential form of Gauss law. You probably all saw that in your course of electrostatics, right? Okay, and uh, since E 
is equal to minus gradient phi. This relation, so we know that gradient of the divergence of, the divergence of a gradient is the Laplacian. So if I put a minus, so means that this is divergence of E, and divergence of E is equal to rho over epsilon zero. So we get another form of Gauss law, which is Laplacian of phi equals minus rho over epsilon zero. So there are three quasi-identical forms of Gauss law, which are here, and which are very important and which we will use all the time. And this is called Poisson law, by the way. So this is uh, Gauss, and this is Poisson. OK, so another important thing is about uh, boundary conditions. Boundary conditions. Any question about Gauss law? <coughs> okay. Boundary conditions. Uh, imagine you have a charged surface with charge density sigma of R. So on one side, you have E1 very close to the surface. So let's see. Uh, locally, I take a piece of this surface. Here I have the sigma. And here I have E1. Here I have E2. So if I define N the normal, the unit vector normal to this, then you can show easily by integrating, uh, by integrating the Gauss law in this form or using this on a certain circuit, you can show that the discontinuity, so it's E1 minus E2. So this uh, condition is uh, very important. It means that the when you, if you have a charged surface, if you look at the electrostatic field on one side, the electrostatic field, if you have a charge, is discontinuous. And the difference between the normal electrostatic field on both sides, so that's the normal electrostatic field because it's projected on the normal, is equal to the charge density on the surface. So that's an important consequence of the Gauss theorem. The other boundary condition is that E1 parallel is equal to E2 parallel. There is no discontinuity in the, so if your field is like this, you have a component like this, so here, this component is the same, but uh, this one can be different. Okay, so the parallel component of the field is conserved at the crossing of the surface, but the <coughs> perpendicular is discontinuous and the discontinuity of the electric field is equal to the charge density. So this all comes from uh, from the Gauss theorem. Okay, what else? 
yes, something that we will use, uh, which is the electrostatic. Static energy. So, if you remember that U is the electrostatic potential energy that we saw, it's Q phi essentially. So, it's one over one half of sum over I and J. If I have charges Q I at point R I, many charges like this. It's sum over one half sum over i not equal to j of q i q j over four pi epsilon zero r i minus r j. Right. The factor one half comes from the double counting of the. So this is the. Each term, 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 qi qj over ri minus rj, is the electrostatic potential energy of interaction between charge i and charge j. If you sum over i and j, you have a double counting because you count pair ij and pair ji, so you need a factor one half to make normal counting. And this you can write as one half of sum over i of qi phi i where phi i is the potential at point r i created by all other charges j not equal to i. Now, if you remember that the charge density is rho of r is equal to sum over i of q i delta of r minus r i, then up to something which I will write. So U of U, the total interaction energy, is equal to one half integral D3R, D3R prime of rho of R, Vc of R minus R prime, rho of R prime. I remind you that Vc of R minus R prime is just 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, 1 over R minus R prime. So you just put this in and you have it. Now, if you do that, of course, you will see that you, in so I, mean, I can, I will do it in a, okay, let me detail it a little bit because, uh, so you, if I, if I replace rho of r by its expression, I will get u equals one half integral d3 r, d3 r prime, sum over i, q i delta of r minus r i, 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, 1 over r minus r prime, sum over j, <coughs> qj, delta of r prime minus rj. Right, I've just rewritten this expression. So, I can do, so I put the sum over i, sum over j outside, I have the QI, QJ, and then <coughs> I have this integral times delta times this times delta. So there is a 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, and then there is a term <coughs> which is 1. Then the delta function tells me to replace R by RI and R prime by RJ. So it's RI minus RJ. So it looks very much like this, right? Except a small problem is that when you write it like this, 
there is a contribution from the terms i equal j. And the terms i equal j are essentially infinite, divergent, and this poses a problem. So we will write it as minus. The tr so here, when I wrote the energy like this, I excluded, of course, the interaction of i with itself, the terms i equal j. So here I have to subtract a term to avoid, so the, this expression is not quite correct. There is something which should be subtracted, which are the terms i equal j. So the term i equal j, it's minus one half. So if I put i equal j, so I will have sum over i of qi square over four pi epsilon zero. So I will not write it as four pi epsilon zero. I write it as qi square, and this is, will be just vc of zero, which is infinite, but it's a number. Okay? So, yes. So I can express, uh, the, this expression is correct, provided I, I subtract minus one half sum over i of qi square times vc of zero. So, but this is a, an expression that we will use uh, very often. Okay, I will skip. Okay, so maybe I will uh, stop at this level. Is there any question? No question. I will do next, uh, so next time I will finish this uh, rapidly, this uh, electrostatics in continuous media. I will just uh, do a few, uh, a, a rapid overview of uh, statistical physics, of what will be needed uh, in uh, statistical physics, and then I will start uh, Poisson-Boltzmann theory. Okay, if it's too fast, too slow, you tell me. Don't hesitate to complain. <laughs>